The success of the Genius Of series has boosted my subscriber count by the thousands, but since I'm passionate about the music industry, I sacrifice money for the views by putting the artist's music in them. In the bio below, feel free to check out my donation choices as it would help me continue making passion and content for you all. Thank you for watching, and let's begin. Drake and Kanye are both generation-defining artists in the world of music. Since they've played major key roles that have determined the fate of modern sound and mainstream media, meant their respective paths would have inevitably crossed, given the competitive nature that is the spirit of hip-hop burrowed in these two since the start of their careers. There wasn't going to be room for either artist without butting heads at least once or twice, and because of this, fan base is split and stands defended their favorite to the end. However, at some point in this feud, verses cut deeper than rap beef, going beyond the typical back and forth records. Diss tracks and one-liners turned into interviews and rants that created narratives which posed to justify their line of defense, but within those petty moments, exposed their egos that interlooped with the pride and legacy they'll carry to the grave, defining what kind of character they portray to the public and who they really are as icons. By the end, we'll have a better understanding of our generational favorites in this story of legends playing chess, but before cracking the surface of this narrative, need to explore both Drake and Kanye's backstories, mindsets, and motives without failing to appreciate the artistry to grasp why they feuded in the first place. But before I continue, I want to lay the grounds for fans of both artists. I don't come from a place of bias, and with that being said, doesn't mean I think one is better than the other. Both artists serve the purpose of their roles to the talent they acclaim, therefore making both equally enjoyable for me. But I digress, that's not the purpose of this video. The ongoing debate on who's better and why is irrelevant in this breakdown because we're here to look at something else. To appreciate the greatness both artists have brought to the table, and how amazing it was to be a part of such an experience as his beef unfolded over the past decade. To see something special we take for granted every day, and that is to be living in a time that can allow the freedom for artists to strive and battle one another, which for them can be a burden to carry, and because of that pressure, allows them to deliver brilliant bodies of work, which gives us shared experiences with the press of a button. But without victimizing our celebrities' actions entirely, can try our best to understand our opposing sides to better grasp why they've chosen these views. So without approaching this segment as a fan of one or the other, approach this from the perspective of being a fan of the culture. Because at the end of the day, what kind of music would they make without their rivals? With pride set aside and our biases in the trash, let's figure out when Yeezy went crazy, Drizzy hid his son from the world, and understand the psychology behind. Drake vs. Kanye The motive behind Kanye West is one we need to understand first. Given his story came before Drake's means we can figure out why he beefed with him to begin with. With the marginalization and limits of African-American communities, Kanye's parents played roles in an attempt to undo the teachings of segregation. His father was a part of the Black Panther activist group, but regardless, didn't make him the best role model for his son at the time. His mother, Donda West, had to wear both hats in the relationship, and because of this, a young Kanye grew fond of her teachings, listening to what she said when hard times erupted. With Donda being a professor at a university, spoke wisdom into Kanye's mind, telling him to always announce his feelings in the moment, and so he did. Peers and teachers would laugh when he'd embellish his dreams of greatness, but the confidence Donda had backed in him motivated him to pursue these ambitions no matter how much hate he had gotten for it. Life wouldn't always be so easy in the south side of Chicago when living paycheck to paycheck, but despite these struggles, Kanye had already been highly skilled in audio production as a young adult. With the help of mentorships and self-teachings, he'd eventually master his practices in mixing soul samples into rap beats. This gave a fresh spin on the sound of hip-hop, since it hadn't really been done the way he was doing it, and because of this, exceeded the niche he was so passionate about as a kid. With years of drive and repetition, Kanye had finally evolved into someone who was talked about in mainstream media, growing his confidence when proving haters wrong, and making his mother proud. However, this newly found fortune came with consequence. In the early 2000s, Kanye had suffered a near-death experience that put him in the hospital. This single moment shaped much of his philosophy, that being, he wasn't going to die without a legacy. By 2007, Kanye West was producing beats for Jay-Z and battled hip-hop legend 50 Cent in an event that'd be called the Clash of Titans, which was a face-off in retail for the first time in rap history. 
Kanye was fully confident in beating 50's first week album sales, to which he did, however, this win was more than just beating an OG in the game. It was the respect both artists had for each other during this battle that made it wholesome, and what made this win bigger was the transition from decades of gangster rap to the melodic pop rap we all know of today. Kanye was on top of the world, but it had all came without sacrifice until the end of that year. Within a few months after the Clash of Titans event, Donda West passed away. Heartbroken and shattered, the shocking news undoubtedly devastated Kanye, but what made it worse was knowing the cosmetic surgery he had paid for led to her fatal end. Carrying the blame of his mother's death on his conscience, Kanye hoped to redeem his mother by becoming the greatest artist that had ever existed. It wasn't Kanye's direct fault she had passed away, but in his mind, that didn't matter. The money gained from fame that stemmed from the potential she had always saw in him killed her. The pressure Kanye effortlessly put on himself became his belief that losing his power in mainstream music was a disservice to the woman who made him, because in his mind, her death would have been for nothing if he didn't take out anyone who tried to surpass him. The motive behind Aubrey Graham is one of reverence. Living with his mother in the snow city of Toronto, Canada, he would often travel across the Canadian state's border to visit his dad in Tennessee. From a young age, Motown and hip-hop were predominant in both cities, sparking his interest in the rich cultures from both areas. By 15, the Canadian native was skilled enough to be casted for a televised high school drama, but within a decade of playing the role, studio choices offset his path to making it a lifelong career, putting Drake in a position where he had money, but was running out of it fast. Whether it be in acting or music, being in the limelight for so long grew his dream of becoming a star, and had strategized a plan in hopes of becoming a rapper next. However, Drake wasn't from the streets, and instead from a predominantly Jewish background, and because of this, made it difficult to be accepted in the rap game, only furthering his drive to write music. His heritage in being a half-black, half-Jewish Canadian rapper who was on a television show meant he had frequent backlash, such as questioning his ability to be a part of this culture. But despite all of the hate, Drake had seen these doubts as factors that play into his character as an artist. His mother was always highly supportive of him, and suggested that he'd sing in his raps as well, an often unseen advantage most rappers would shy away from. But because of artists like Lil Wayne and Kanye West, the roads that would have been needed to do so were paved by them a few years prior. With the confidence and respect Drake held for the game, the passion he had for competition rose him through the ranks as an underground artist, eventually hitting a stopping point to which he'd consider recasting his dream and becoming a pop star. But despite these moments of unreasonable doubt, Drake had gotten a call from his idol who was considered to be one of the GOATs during this era, Lil Wayne himself. He would soon fly Drake across the United States and mentor him through the trenches of the music industry. Because of this, his drive for dominance grew beyond the potential anyone can see in him, eventually becoming the hottest artist out of Canada, putting Toronto on the map and dominating the industry in a way that wouldn't leave space for other artists to compete, ultimately putting distance between himself and the ones who came before him. Despite what anyone said about Drake, he had a drive to be the greatest and thrived off competition with anyone he needed to in order to become the best of a generation. A generation that was hard for legends to coexist without questioning each other's presence. Now that Drake and Kanye are making waves in their own lane, I'll be summing up their history in three acts, because from this point in their relationship, it was only destined for a seasoned vet and a newcomer to collaborate behind the scenes. First, I'll note almost every encounter by date that carried the narrative on, and sum up the story at the end of each act. This way we'll have a better understanding on how they think and move business-wise. January 12, 2010. Kanye directs the music video for Drake's Best I Ever Had. This act alone began one of many things Ye had helped Drake with early on in his career. The song had come from Drake's third mixtape, So Far Gone, released in 2009. 2010, Ye produces Drake's Find Your Love, that peaked at number 5 on Billboard, being one of Drake's first smash hits from his debut studio album, Thank Me Later, released in 2010. November of 2010, Ye and Jay began recording Watch the Throne, creating a joint project for fans of hip-hop. The world picked up on the rumors of an upcoming Ye and Jay project, thus generating hype. The duo were best friends, thanks to Kanye's skills in production back in the early 2000s that made it inevitable for them to create a joint album together. 
February 8th, 2011, Drake remixes Kanye's All of the Lights from 2010's album My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy to show his love for the culture and respect for Kanye West. May 20th, 2011, Drake shows signs of competition on DJ Khaled's I'm On One and later sneak disses Ye on Twitter. In the song, Drake's last lines in his verse goes, I'm just feeling like the throne is for the taking, watch me take it alluding to the possibility that he knew Kanye may have been worried of his potential by mentioning the joint project between him and Jay. Drake later goes to Twitter in response to that line and says, Hove dis? Hove of all people has not lost it. That's a god body flow, without mentioning Kanye's contribution to the joint album. August 8th, 2011, Kanye and Jay-Z release Watch the Throne that dominated the current space in hip-hop, housing anthems such as Otis, No Church in the Wild, and Niggas in Paris during this project. October 26, 2011, Drake calls Kanye competition on the November issue of The Source magazine, saying, When I was a kid trying to figure out what I liked, it was Kanye who I related to the most. He was an artist in every sense, from his cover art to his music. Now I would say he was really a great competitor, suggesting that he'd like to surpass him one day. August 5, 2013, Ye tells Drake on stage, Watch the Throne was made because of him. Drake calls Kanye a god in response, later telling Revolt that he's always looked up to Ye and studies him close. June 18th, 2013, Kanye released his sixth studio album Yeezus, and within a few months, Drake remixes Migos' Versace. The Yeezus album was heavily criticized by fans at the time, given Kanye experimented more with electronic music. However, in the Versace remix, Drake says, I do not fuck with your new shit, my nigga, don't ask for my take on it. Although this isn't directly a diss, the line did follow bars that were considering he may have been referencing Kanye after all, with lines like, rap must be changing cause I'm at the top and ain't no one on top of me, and a few lines before the probable Yeezus diss saying, the album is coming, September just wait on it, alluding to his upcoming record, if you're reading this it's too late, having more replay value than Kanye's Yeezus. December 6, 2013. Ye says in the Juan Epstein podcast how he didn't mind helping Drake out with Find Your Love, and presumably everything else in his early career up until he got too big for him, leaving Ye to switch his energy with Drake from here on out. February 13th, 2014, Drake tells Rolling Stone he was ambivalent about Yeezus in that there were some real questionable bars on there. However, Drake says he speaks from a place of respect by saying, Kanye's the reason I'm here. I love everything about that guy, assuming he comes from a fan's perspective on his album. Ye later says on Sidebar how media is trying to pin two greats against each other and squashes any beef the media was trying to portray. 2015, Kanye joins The Breakfast Club and says how Drake and him were going to release a joint project called Wolves. January 30th, 2016, Drake releases Summer 16, getting petty with his wordplay mentioning how he became the next Jay-Z and how he's got a bigger pool than Ye. Ye later comes out and says he has three pools, and their friendship in the media starts to form a rival's perspective on the two's relationship. April 5th, 2016, Drake releases Pop Style, featuring the iconic duo, which was released as a single to promote his fourth studio album, Views. However, replaces them with his own verse on the album's released version of the song. Ye claims Jay didn't want to be on the album out of respect for Meek Mill, which at the time was who Drake was beefing with, therefore leaving Kanye off the song entirely. August 30th, 2016, during Drake's annual OVO Fest, Ye teases Wolves a second time, with Drake's only reply being, Hallelujah. Billboards around the city made it seem like the joint project was happening. However, it never did. November 19th, 2016, during Kanye's Sacramento performance, he outed DJ Khaled and Drake for paying radio to play their new single for free. Drake later says he went from working on Wolves with Ye to Ye publicly shitting on him and DJ Khaled, thus creating a split between the two artists and a narrative in the media promoting rivalry. From here on out, the two artists' relationship would never be the same. Drake and Kanye West became friends in the light of fame by auditing one another's pockets and creating legendary moments in the early 2010s. Ye was Drake's loosely acquainted mentor during this time period by directing and producing various tracks and music videos, but only until Drake became confident enough to maneuver the game within the confines of his own fan base. During this time period, Drake recognized his true potential with the amount of numbers he can hit, followed by the accolades he obtained and knew the only one who was capable of doing the same numbers consistently as him was Kanye West himself. Kanye had no intention to beef with anyone in his own interest. 
He wasn't about that life, even though he's a rapper, but because of the 2007 Clash of Titans event between him and 50, meant it wasn't impossible for Drake to see a future when competing with him. After all, if Drake were to play his cards right, it would just, just being competitive, you know, as far as yeah. hip hop is concerned. The competitive nature of it is something different. And because of this, Drake wanted the chance to beef with a hip hop legend. But given Kanye probably wouldn't have done another Clash of Titans scenario, Drake decided to compete with Ye in a way that audiences couldn't shy away from. In other words, instead of attacking Kanye by dissing him directly, he would sneak diss him while publicly suggesting he was falling off without forgetting to give him credit for paving the way, retrospectively replacing him as the face of a generation as the years went on. This strategy alone created respect on Drake's behalf, given he could have easily destroyed Kanye in a diss track due to his overall lyrical ability, but again, to no avail. By playing his cards right and pushing Kanye's buttons over the years, Kanye would have eventually had to respond, but instead Kanye countered Drake's move by working on a joint album with him, and in doing so, could push the narrative that there wasn't competition to begin with. Over the years, Ye knew what Drake was doing, which is why he tried to calm the media down about a rivalry since the 2013 Juan Epstein podcast. This is why we saw Kanye push the Wolves collab album often more times than Drake did. However, if Kanye went through with releasing this joint album, he would have potentially put himself in a position to be the superior in this circumstance, eliminating any potential beef between the two artists. Regardless, given it was Drake season now, people would have been saying Drake was just as good as Kanye if this album had ever released, given his commercial success and skill set during this time period in his career. But Kanye didn't let this scenario happen, eventually snapping during the 2016 Sacramento show and airing out dirty laundry from not only Drake, but also other personal interactions he had with Jay-Z, politicians, and the Nike Corporation. Things weren't looking too good for Ye publicly, and so Drake backed off, letting Kanye destroy his public image since then, and taking his place as the face of a generation. Nevertheless, despite the media's negative perception of Kanye West during the time period, Drake still underestimated his ability to bounce back, because Kanye wasn't going to let anyone but himself sit on his throne until he was dead. The entirety of 2017, Kanye took a year from releasing content, working on his good music artist projects, and strategizing a way to overthrow Drake to reclaim his throne in mainstream music. Obviously, this wouldn't be the only thing he was caught up with, but by this point, Ye was sick of Drake sneak dissing him in songs and still playing nice with him. It was finally time for Kanye to get a little summer revenge. Early 2018, Kanye planned to hang out with Drake, selling him on a story about needing to be transparent with him, which meant playing his unreleased music from his upcoming album Scorpion and telling him the release date. Drake hesitantly played songs off the unreleased Scorpion album, and Kanye showed Drake the Lift Yourself beat, promising to have him on. By the end of this interaction, Kanye invites Drake to his Wyoming home studio. March 8th, 2018, Drake's producer 40 heads to Wyoming on the 7th, a day before Drake did admitting to Drake that something felt off. When Drake had arrived, Kanye told him he needed to know his release dates, even though Drake wasn't keen on sharing his schedule. Drake ends up showing Kanye March 14th, a song about a son that he's hiding from the public, and is thinking about putting on his upcoming album, Scorpion. At the time, Kanye wasn't fond of Nike, given they denied any creative control over his sneaker brand, Yeezy, so instead, signed a contract with Adidas. Drake must have told him he wanted to reveal his son during a press release with Adidas, and shared a picture of his son Adonis to Kanye. In pure speculation, Kanye probably didn't like Drake's press release plan, given his contract was with the same company. Regardless, this would have been one of many problems that carried out on this day. The rest of the time, Drake and 40 helped Kanye with his upcoming album, Ye, writing the chorus for Yikes that would later appear on it. Drake and 40 left Wyoming with a promised verse on Lift Yourself and felt like they had accomplished nothing for themselves. April 16th, 2018, Drake goes to Instagram to announce his fifth studio album, Scorpion. April 19th, 2018, Kanye announces his eighth studio album, Ye, along with four other artists' release dates from his Good Music record label on Twitter. By doing this, Kanye flooded the music market, leaving Drake with less room for ears on his summer release date, the release date he told Kanye a month prior during the Wyoming studio session. April 29, 2018, the promised Lift Yourself beat was released without Drake's verse on it. Kanye uploaded the promised song, to which a majority of the lyrics were, Poop Diddy Scoop, Scoop Diddy Whoop. Nobody knew why Kanye did this, besides Kanye and Drake. 
May 25, 2018 an early 2000s rapper by the name Pusha T is the president of Kanye's Good Music label, who coincidentally had beef with Drake's mentor, Lil Wayne, way back in the early 2000s. On the Daytona track, Infrared, Pusha T disses Drake for having ghostwriters. Later that day, Drake sends an invoice of 100,000 USD to Push in regards to reviving his career after this diss, and drops his response, Duppy Freestyle, a diss track to Pusha himself, Kanye for letting him release this song, and mentions Pusha T's fiance, Virginia Williams. May 26, 2018, Drake releases I'm Upset, a single off of his new album Scorpion, a day after releasing Duppy Freestyle, which acts as an homage to Drake's earlier career beef with Meek Mill, with the Charged Up diss track and the Back to Back diss track that were also both released a day after another in 2015. That beef Drake had won. However, May 29, 2018, Pusha T responds to Drake's Duppy freestyle and shocks the world with an announcement of his hidden son on the diss track, The Story of Adidon, calling him a deadbeat father while making fun of his baby mama, who happens to be a porn actress, and for him being upset. He also goes after Drake's producer 40 for his autoimmune disease, given it could one day become fatal. By the end of the song, Pusha insists Drake responds, and that it'll be a surgical summer when he does. The cover art for this song illustrates Drake in blackface that was never seen by the world. Drake later comes out and says it was from his acting career in 2007, a time in his life where he was working on a project about young black actors struggling to get roles in the world of film. Late May, early June, 2018, Drake feels the pressure, creating a response track to the world shocker that was the story of Adidon. Drake calls LeBron James and asks him if he'd be disappointed if he had released this song, because apparently it would have made Drake the bad guy in this beef. Regardless of what information Drake may have dug up, LeBron said he would never be disappointed in Drake. Drake decided not to release it because he didn't want to be the villain in this beef, neglecting another chance to play into Pusha T's game, and didn't want to give him any more mainstream attention than needed. Mid to late June 2018, Drake reworks a majority of his Scorpion album, creating Nonstop, Emotionless, 8 Out of 10, Mob Ties, and In My Feelings. On In My Feelings, Drake sings about a woman named Kiki, sparking rumors that Kiki was Kanye's wife, Kim Kardashian. June 29, 2018, Drake releases his new album Scorpion that loosely responds to Pusha T's The Story of Added On diss track by sneak dissing Kanye and addressing his newly found fatherhood throughout these various reworked tracks. His appearance on this album seemingly goes unbothered in light of having a son to celebrate, but regardless of what his next move would have been, popular opinion still swayed towards The Story of Added On after the bombshell reveal of his son, ultimately making Pusha T the winner of this beef. On the track, Talk Up, Drake has Kanye's best friend Jay-Z featured. The instrumental samples an old N.W.A. song that Kanye once experimented with for Jay-Z in the early days of Kanye's career. August 3rd, 2018, Travis Scott releases Sicko Mode that features Drake. In the psychedelic three-part banger, Drake subliminally raps about heading to Kanye's house and screwing his wife, Kim Kardashian, furthering the idea that Drake had slept with her after the In My Feelings track and continuously poked fun at Kanye's insecurities. At the time, Drake had lived four to five blocks down from Kim and Kanye in Calabasas. Kanye didn't like how Travis let Drake sneak diss his wife on a song, because Travis is a part of the Good Music label and Kanye's camp of successful artists. Travis said he had no idea of the diss and turned up to it when he first heard it. After the song's release, it went viral, giving Travis Scott his first number one single. August 18th, 2018, Drake replaces a line in Know Yourself and said, then Kanye flopped. Referring to Kanye's recent album Ye that sold 208,000 units in first week album sales, which was 452,000 less than Drake's Scorpio. August 29, 2018, Kanye appears on Chicago's 107.5, the city where he's from's radio station. In this interview, Kanye expresses unusual behaviors when denying giving Pusha info on Drake's son, and later expressing jealousy and frustration when talking about Drake being played in his hometown more than him. September 20th, 2018, Kanye publicly responds to Drake about alluding to screwing his wife, saying, the rumors he's carrying didn't sit right with my spirit, and how he wouldn't have let Pusha diss him on his beat infrared if he wasn't in a medicated state, after saying in the previous interview, I can't tell that man not to. That same day, French Montana releases No Stylist featuring Drake, where Drake disses Ye's Yeezy brand. Late September 2018, Drake follows Kim Kardashian on Instagram to antagonize Kanye after September 20th's rants about Ye's wife. 
October 12, 2018, LeBron James talk show The Shop aired an episode with special guest Drake, who admitted to the world he was supposed to be on Lift Yourself, and tells everyone Kanye had planned this since March, exposing everything that had happened at Kanye's Wyoming ranch. Although this interview lacked question regarding some of Drake's contradictions when telling LeBron and Maverick that there are fucking rules in this shit made this entire interview seem a bit biased and set up to persuade the public on who won the beef. He expresses his anger towards Pusha, stating Wishing death on my friend that has MS. Someone's gonna fucking punch you in the fucking face. The, the, the shit's done, the event's over. I wanted to do other things. I didn't want to further your reputation or your career by rapping back at you and having this exchange. October 19th. 2018, Pusha T appears on Joe Budden's podcast, clearing up that rules and beef. There are none. Including letting the world know that he was in Wyoming from the 1st through the 7th, and how Kanye didn't allow him in the studio with Drake when he came in on the 8th. Pusha also says he doesn't blame Drake for thinking that Kanye told him about his son Adonis, because from Drake's perspective, it would make perfect sense. However, this wasn't the case. What had really happened was, um, the information came from 40. It didn't come from Kanye. Mm. At all. Pusha T also mentions how Drake's team tried bribing a member of Pusha's, having the phone call recorded for proof. 40 is sleeping with a woman. He talks to her every, he talks to her daily, five, six hours a day. Okay. With that, with that also came the fact that Drake has a child. Oh, she must have a great personality. Yeah, bruh. Come on. <laughs> on top of this, the women who Pillow Talk told Pusha that 40 felt neglected by the success of Drake. After this interview, Drake didn't respond. November 21st, 2018, Pusha T gets drinks thrown at him in Drake's hometown of Toronto during an ongoing stage performance. A man was supposedly stabbed in an attempt to jump him. Drake fans go to social media to clown push. December 13th, 2018, Kanye posts over 125 tweets in an attempt to point fingers at Drake, telling him to stop sending him purple emojis and claiming that he had called him and threatened his life. Despite if this is true or not, Drake released a track titled Mob Ties that same year that subliminally suggested he had sent a hit on former rival XXXTentacion. Regardless if this theory is true or not, Drake played into the mob boss role during Scorpion, seamlessly making certain events seem non-coincidental. Kanye scarcely reminds the public that Drake's former rival was killed that summer, and Pusha T was almost jumped all within a few months. Kanye also says that if anything had happened to him, that Drake would be the prime suspect. Kanye declines a sample clearance Drake requested for a 2009 remix to Kanye's Say You Will that presumably would have been on Drake's 2019 compilation album, Care Package. Drake responds on Instagram with three laughing emojis. December 29th, 2018, Kanye finds out Drake followed Kim on Instagram back in September to get on his nerves, and angrily responds on Twitter to express how he feels about this. Kanye later deletes these tweets. January 2nd, 2019, Drake unfollows Kim Kardashian after Kanye's expressed his undeniable discomfort. December 25th, 2019, Drake concludes the decade with a two-hour interview from Rap Radar, telling them the Pusha T diss track The Story of Adidon was a genius chess move and how he had won because of it. Salty yet honest, he also tells them that he has no interest in relinking with Kanye after the Wyoming incident, leaving the beef at a temporary stalemate. From the fact these two live close to one another, to Drake's producer 40 pillow talking to a woman, as funny as this section was messy to unfold, it all began when Drake fed into Kanye's plan during the March Wyoming session. During this session, Kanye used his hospitality to obtain Drake's release schedule, and as a bonus, learned about his son Adonis. Ye then uses information against him by announcing release dates for his own label's projects over the course of when Drake was supposed to release, which in return, messed up his first week album sales for Scorpion, on top of trolling him by releasing the song he was promised to be on. In doing so, was Kanye's way of getting back at Drake for all of the sneak dissing and button pressing he had done during Act 1, and in Kanye's eyes, a taste of his own medicine. By the time Drake had figured out Kanye's plan to take back his spot in mainstream music, it was too late because Kanye was already seven steps ahead. One of Kanye's artist album releases was Pusha T's Daytona that had sneaked this Drake in hopes he'd respond, but with how fast Drake had released Duppy Freestyle on the same day, shocked Push, as mentioned in the Joe Budden interview, admitting his quick response messed up his press release for Daytona. This is when the beef went from Drake vs Kanye to Drake vs Pusha T. 
Kanye was able to avoid being pressured to make a diss track by inserting a real MC into a fire he set ablaze. Drake attacked Push by the lack of accolades and social status he has, which ultimately fell flat because Pusha T never desired to be a pop star in the first place. This was Drake's moment to finally beef with Kanye, yet was so eager that he fell right into their trap. Not only did Drake make the wrong move by responding to Push, but also decided to mention his fiance in the track as well, thus giving Push the all clear to take things to the next level by announcing his son to the world in the story of Adidas. The reveal alone was enough to seal the opinion of the media when deciding on a winner of this beef, despite Drake's lyrical ability in Duppy Freestyle. How Push got the information about his son is where things get confusing. Given Drake had shown Kanye a picture of his son during the same time he was gathering information to overthrow him, only made sense since Kanye would have just told Push. But Push claims this isn't what happened. I could only imagine the follow-up diss Push had for Drake if he had responded to the story of Adidas. It would have been another world-shocking diss track that would have revealed how the woman 40 Pella talked with betrayed his trust and opened his mouth about Drake's son to push a tease camp. It's a good thing Drake bit his tongue before deciding to release this supposed unreleased diss track, otherwise he would have dug himself into a deeper hole that would have been harder to escape from. But still, Push could potentially be lying about 40 in favor of making Kanye look innocent in all of this. Think about it. When piecing together these loose details, we can recall that 40 was at Wyoming a day before Drake was, and told Drake something fell off as mentioned on the shop. Push later appeared on the Joe Budden podcast, admitting he was at the same location from the 1st to the 7th and that the 7th was a day before Drake had arrived to Wyoming, the same day 40 made this call to Drake. That means if both Drake and Push are telling the truth, then Push and 40 were in the same location on the same day, and had most likely worked together in Kanye's Wyoming studio. Either Push and Kanye created this master plan and pinned 40 as a loose lip trader, or 40 had a woman with him who ended up spilling this information to Push during this day. What do you think happened? Let's talk about it in the comments below. With everything that has transpired publicly, Kanye was caught in a few lies. On Ye's September 20th, 2018 guest appearance, he says he wouldn't have let Push diss Drake on his beat, but then also says, I can't tell that man not to, ultimately contradicting himself while claiming to be in a medicated state. Granted, Kanye was fighting his own demons at the time, however, it didn't excuse him from the media questioning his role in all of this, given he had started this controversy to begin with, yet still avoided dropping a diss track on Drake and I partially believe this is because Kanye knows Drake is lyrically better than him. Regardless of skill level, Ye isn't as faithful to the origins of hip hop like Drake is. Let me explain. Kanye doesn't make diss tracks because he primarily focuses on being a legend, the likes of Michael Jackson or the Beatles, hence the Pusha T involvement when Drake finally got his chance to let loose with Duppy Freestyle. In Kanye's mind, if he were to beef with artists he sees below him, then he'd let their legacy dirty his shine. However, in doing so, contradicts a lot of what he represents in the world of hip hop culture. Let me explain. Hip hop was based on battle rapping, and with the staged 106 and Park Clash of Titans event between him and 50, showed his competitive side existed when it came to first week album sales. But when you become the legend and are challenged by the newcomer who's proved himself a worthy opponent, how are you supposed to consider yourself the greatest rapper to exist without getting in the ring and spitting some fucking heat? Nevertheless, the chess move Kanye made when deciding to let an MC go for Drake's neck was a genius play on his part, but to note my personal opinion, I really wanted Kanye to enter an entirely new level of rap when responding to Drake instead of seeing him tweet. So when I say Kanye isn't as faithful to the origins of hip hop like Drake is, doesn't make him any less hip hop than him either. Let's not forget the lanes Kanye has paid for Drake to be on in the first place. Both artists have proved themselves worthy of the title of legend, just like how J. Cole says two legends can coexist in current times, but given how big both artists' egos are, didn't mean they weren't done butting heads. Drake took a major loss from Push when giving up this information, and regardless of how he carried himself in a nonchalant way post-2018, doesn't mean he didn't have an unresolved conflict with Kanye for making this move with him. Drake won't let this go until Kanye finally drops a diss track. However, Kanye's not budging, and because of this, Drake continuously waited for a chance to lyrically obliterate him. January 10th, 2020. Future releases Life is Good, featuring a bar from Drake who admitted he was caught slipping, referring to the Pusha T disc, but explains how it didn't matter because his public domain still stood strong. 
July 18, 2020, Kanye announces his 10th studio album, Donda, scheduled to release on July 24, 2020. But in pure Kanye fashion, didn't meet the deadline as his way of building hype. July 20, 2020, Drake releases Only You Freestyle, where he inconspicuously reminds Kanye that he hasn't gone anywhere. In the offbeat section of his verse, he alludes to Kanye hiding behind Pusha T during their beef, and reminds him how he'll lay him down lyrically and will only stop rapping when he decides to. August 14, 2020, Drake releases Laugh Now Cry Later, a single geared up to be on his sixth studio album Certified Lover Boy that was first announced by January 20th, 2021. Drake delays Certified Lover Boy due to a leg injury and reworks a number of tracks on the album. May 23rd, 2021, Drake was crowned Artist of the Decade by Billboard Music Awards for the 2010s. The artist who had won this before him was Mariah Carey in the 90s and Eminem in the early 2000s. July 22nd, 2021, Kanye hosts the first Donda listening session at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, telling the world it will be released the following night, and yet again, did it. July 24th, 2021, a good music representative by the name Consequence tweeted, We looking for a Drake drop date, thus setting in motion the continuation of Drake vs. Kanye. August 5th, 2021, Kanye hosts another listening session after renting out the Mercedes-Benz Stadium to finish Donda, and tells the world it'll be released on the 15th of the month, to which it never did. Mid to late August 2021, fans speculate Drake and Kanye will release on the same day to compete with each other's first week album sales, mirroring how Kanye competed with 50 during the Clash of Titans event. Fans clown Drake on the media, saying he is scared to. August 21st, 2021, Trippy Red releases Betrayal, with the bar from Drake responding to fans of both artists, reassuring him he isn't scared to compete with Kanye in first week album sales. He goes on to take shots at Push and promises Kanye won't change a thing for him because his legacy is set in stone. The same day, Kanye puts Drake in a group chat with Push and others, stating Drake will never recover, and called him a nerd-ass jock nigga, sending him a photo of the Joker. August 23, 2021, Kanye doxes Drake's already publicized home address, later deleting the post from his Instagram. Drake responds on his Instagram story laughing. August 26, 2021, Kanye hosts third, final, and biggest Donda listening session at Chicago's Soldier Field Stadium, generating hype for his soon-to-be-released Donda album. August 27, 2021, Drake announced Certified Lover Boy's release to be on September 3rd during a halftime commercial on SportsCenter. August 28, 2021, Drake fans vandalized Kanye's childhood home to promote Certified Lover Boy. August 29, 2021, Donda released six days before Drake's September 3rd release date. Kanye states on Instagram that Universal Music Group released the album prematurely and was out of his control. Fans speculate Universal did this because they knew Drake would win first week album sales and stunt Donda's full money-making potential. Several tracks on Donda dissed Drake. August 31st, 2021, Pusha T likes a visual activist's IG post clowning Drake's choice for an album cover. September 3rd, 2021, Drake releases Certified Lover Boy that has a diss track called 7am on Bridal Path, where he responds to Kanye doxing his address by saying, get that address to your driver, make it your destination instead of just a post out of desperation. Drake also says, why the fuck we peacemaking doing the explanations if we just gonna be right back in that bitch without hesitation? Referring to an unknown date where Kanye invited Drake back to Wyoming with Future sometime earlier in the year. September 4th, 2021, Drake leaks Kanye's unreleased song, Life of the Party, where Kanye disses Drake in several bars. Gay fans go to media and clown Drake for releasing a song that they say was better than his entire album. November 4th, 2021, Kanye appears on an episode of Drink Champs, saying he talked to Drake and made him admit he never screwed his wife, and also said Drake has been important to the algorithm of the game, giving him credit for his talent. Kanye later goes to mention how signing good music artist Big Sean was the worst thing he had ever done because Sean had sided with the Democrats during his run for office. When I die, on my tombstone it's gonna say, I deserve to be here because I signed Big Sean. <laughs> Kanye also says, when I released Donda, slipping up and admitting it wasn't Universal who released it early, but Ye himself. November 9, 2021, Kanye uploads an Instagram video in hopes to make amends with Drake and put their past behind them by attempting to free Larry Hoover in a future concert event. November 16, 2021, Drake and Kanye post up together for the first time in years. They make amends and get drunk together. December 15, 2021, after a series of tweets from Big Sean stating how he was with Ye days prior to getting dissed by him, 
Big Sean makes an appearance on Drink Champs in response to it, saying, What he said was some bitch-ass shit. Big Sean also outs many of Ye's worst behaviors behind the 2015 release of Dark Sky Paradise, Sean's album that had both Kanye and Drake on it. According to Sean, It all goes back to the song Blessings. Everything goes back yeah. to, like, something to do with Drake. <laughs> I mean, not to be funny, but it's just like the obsession. So let's just be clear. Did you think that he didn't want you to have Drake on that record? Or did he want to be on that record? It was me and Drake. Uh huh. My album was due, immediately due that day. I had been playing on the music, played on the final album. He said he heard blessings and said, I have to be on here. I was like, bro, I already got you on two songs on my album. He hopped on two other songs already. So that would have been three songs he's on, on the album. He's like, I need to be on this record. And I helped him write his verse for the song. For blessings. For blessings. Okay. So I hit up Drake. Drake was the one who came up with the idea of the song. We got in the studio and finished it together. So when I when I talked to Drake about it, Drake didn't want Kanye on that. Kanye had been obsessed with Drake since the Blessings verse, and how Ye spazzed on him over Drake as if he was supposed to be loyal to Kanye. This man really picked this up and said that that's his worst decision. It was Halloween. Come on. It was Halloween it wasn't, though. It wasn't even cousin music, bro. It was because of some bullshit that wasn't even true. He said it was some political bullshit. So, fuck this shit. Fuck what he yeah. talking about. December 9th, 2021. Kanye brings out Drake as a guest during an event to free Larry Hoover. Their beef is officially over, performing each other's songs and finally coexisting as legends. The 2007 Clash of Titans event was a monumental moment in hip-hop between Kanye West and 50 Cent, becoming hip-hop's first battle in retail. But although these two were competing, did so in a manner that was subjective to the true nature of hip-hop, given it wasn't real beef, but instead a manufactured competition in first week sales between albums. With the announcement of good music representative Consequence tweeting, we looking for a Drake drop date some 14 years after this event, became an exciting time for fans of both artists, given this also would have been a battle in retail between Kanye's Donda and Drake's certified lover boy. The only difference is, Kanye's beefing for real this time, having a legacy to fulfill, and Drake couldn't have been more prepared. Over the years after the death of Donda West, Kanye's drive has been primarily to become the greatest artist ever. But once he saw his nuance was fading and other artists thriving, he had a realization that he needed to be bigger outside of the views of a rapper, and in the words of Kobe Bryant, a different, different animal, animal but the, the same, same beast. beast. What the f does that mean, Kobe Bryant? You're welcome. Kanye would soon figure out he was more than an artist, but a leader. Someone who wanted to rise up and use their power to figure out ways to help the world. Sometimes, he didn't know the best ways, but still tried all in the name of Donda West, because this is what his mother would have wanted for him. Absolute greatness. Kanye still deals with the trauma of her death by blaming himself for it, and now that a Clash of Titans scenario has presented itself, he can finally get redemption after years of Drake taking his spot in mainstream music. This is what Drake had wanted, a chance to show the world his artistry by topping the last man on the throne, just like Kanye did in the early 2000s, and rightfully so. This is the game of hip-hop, and it's Drake season now, but Kanye's ready to take it back. Throughout the months, shots were sent from Drake in Only You Freestyle and in Betrayal, ready for Kanye to respond, but yet again, only did through tweets and group chats. After Kanye told him he would never recover and sent him a picture of the Joker, Drake responded by mimicking the Joker's actions from the Dark Knight movie, appearing to hack a Sports Center halftime commercial, revealing the release date for his album that he'll destroy Kanye in first week sales with. This was a genius and well thought out move by Drake. Nevertheless, Kanye was ready for that release date by uniting the newest and best artists in the game with him on Donda. There was no possible way Drake could beat him given the three colossal listening parties that built hype on top of the other artists' fan bases tuning in as well. Although fans from both sides clowned one another's artists, Drake vs Kanye was officially happening. However, the excitement from both sides fell short when Kanye claimed Universal released his album a week before Drake's. It made sense. Universal knows Drake's first week sales will blow Kanye's away without him ever having to have a rollout besides an Instagram promotion and a heart cut into his hair. That in itself is a flex Drake will take to the grave, because Drake's demographic is to appeal to the masses. After Kanye lost by over 300,000 units in first week sales, he unintentionally admitted to releasing the album on the Drink Champs podcast, which means he lied about Universal releasing it. 
Although this move made many hip-hop fans disappointed, it only made it clear that Kanye knew Drake would beat him out in sales. But with that knowledge, use the Drake vs Kanye narrative as leverage by gaining popular opinion. When doing something as grand as Kanye's listening events, it creates new experiences people can relate to, thus causing popular opinion to be won by Kanye. But given the tweet by Good Music Rep Consequence insinuated this was a battle in retail, in which Drake had ultimately won against Kanye West. Ye eventually became the bigger person, and used this Drake vs Kanye narrative to promote himself during times of redemption, ending the beef between the two and inviting him as a guest to an event in promotion of freeing Larry Hoover. Drake invited Kanye over to his house, to which they got wasted together, concluding that both are legends in their own lanes and ending their beef for good. I will say, this was an incredible ending to a rap beef that we've ever seen before, but although their motives were resolved, a part of me believes a lot of ego still resides within them, forcing a false public narrative that is their friendship when in actuality, don't talk to one another. But to settle differences in what felt like a cohesive ending, fans of both sides continue to defend who they think is better, trash talking the opposing artist and giving unbiased reasons as to why they dislike them. Kanye is crazy, Drake hit his child, Kanye is egotistical, Drake makes trash music. In spite of this conclusive setting, I think fans of both sides can agree it didn't feel very conclusive. But why? Shouldn't the fans be getting along with one another? Forcing narratives that benefit these artists' respected sides is only in their best interest as businessmen. After Act 2, a lot of people got tired of them beefing. This put Drake in a position to counter losing the Pusha T beef by continuing to make hits and sneak diss Ye in his music, as if he wasn't beefing at all whilst holding mainstream power. Kanye on the other hand, reclaimed his throne by orchestrating the Drake and Push beef while publicly promoting himself as the greatest of all time, ultimately continuing to indirectly battle Drake in Act 3. However, Kanye now has to share this throne with Drake, because he wasn't beaten by Kanye a man who came up on battling first week sales with 50 Cent, but beaten by Pusha T, an MC who doesn't care about the accolades and critical acclaim that Drake tried using against him. Now that we've dove into the psychology behind Drake vs Kanye, we now have a better understanding as to why they've beefed to begin with, hopefully holding a certain level of respect that can be turned into an unbiased window for opposing sides to take a listen to one another's favorite artist's music. But regardless of opinion, both artists hold mainstream power and can finally lay claim to their respective lanes without interference. Drake became artist of the decade, fulfilling his motive to become an all-time icon, and Kanye is fulfilling his motive as well, honoring his mother by being one of the greatest too. For them to coexist at the same time in a culture we love is incredible, but if it wasn't for the sneak dissing, shade throwing, chess moves, and celebrity drama, what would become of the culture we're so fascinated with? At the end of the day, this is how the game should be, how we as a community should view it. By seeing something special we take for granted every day, and that is to be living in a time that can allow the freedom for artists to strive and battle one another, which for them can be a burden to carry, and because of that pressure, allows them to deliver brilliant bodies of work which gives us shared experiences with the press of a button. If you've enjoyed this content, consider subscribing and commenting to help support the channel. Check out my socials and feel free to donate in the bio below. Thank you for watching.